So wonderful. Thank you for being here. And it is time to get started. Officially welcome everyone to Digital Earth Academy ICE. Now, the first thing I want to say is that we want to respectfully acknowledge that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is built on lands traditionally stewarded by the Ute, Arapaho, and Cheyenne nations. Um, and that lands all over the world have been and continue to be stewarded by indigenous people. Um, throughout the program today, you'll have a couple ways you can interact with us. There will be a poll or two, um, and in the chat, you can respond to when our presenter, Dr. Bob Reynolds, uh, asks you a question. And also, if you have a question at any point during the program, you can put it in there. Um, you won't see each other's chats, but I will be keeping an eye on that, and we'll keep all those questions. And at the end, we'll have some time to address your questions. So with no further ado, I would like to pass it over to our presenter today, geologist Bob Reynolds. Take it away, Bob. Well, thank you very much, Mitch. Thanks for organizing this. And uh, this is really a team effort from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We've got people behind the scenes. Uh, we've got Asa, who's being who's flying us using the uh, program called Open Space, which is a NASA product. And we've got lots of other people that have helped out. Kim and others uh, are working to put this all together. So we're delighted to have you all joining us. The topic today is ice. And ice is a mineral, actually. Uh, it's frozen water. I'm a geologist and I love minerals. So it's fun to think about ice as a mineral. And ice is a wonderful, beautiful, and uh, fabulous ice topic, and uh, particularly relevant to the Earth because the Earth is a water planet. We're going to start out from the museum parking lot and see if we can pull up into uh, satellite elevation and uh, move over towards the west. So you're Seeing ACES got us there pinned at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, which we hope you've all had a chance to visit. We'll talk more about the museum in a moment, but we're leaving the parking lot. We're leaving Denver. We're up at balloon level, going up to airplane level, and we're pretty soon we're going to be up at satellite level up in space, and we're going to move across the planet. You're seeing the Rocky Mountains coming into view there, the high plains on the right, the Rocky Mountains on the left. And then as we move across the Rocky Mountains, you're seeing the dry ground out in the uh, arid uh, Utah and the uh, deserts out there in Nevada. Then we cross the Sierra Nevada, crossing California. And there's a great big blue area coming into view out here. And uh, I hope you guys know the name of the big blue that you're seeing here. Uh, I'm looking in the chat to see people chiming in that they know what that blue thing is called. And uh, it's an ocean. And uh, I hope that you know its name. And it's got an island chain in the middle of it. There we go. People <laughs> know the name of the ocean. It's the Pacific Ocean. And uh, we've got this view, Asa is showing us this view, uh, to emphasize the fact that the Earth is covered by a lot of water. Uh, there's a huge amount of water uh, on the planet. And uh, if you look at the planet from outer space, uh, it's often in shades of blue. Uh, it's called the blue marble or the blue sphere. And Earth is the water planet. Well, the water is uh, wet in the oceans, of course. Uh, but as you move up to the polar areas, if we were to go up towards the North Pole or down to the South Pole, the, the water uh, that we see is blue on the planet from this point of view uh, becomes frozen. And you can imagine, uh, you've all thought about the North Pole and the South Pole. The land is super cold in those areas and, and it's actually ice. And so the, the challenge that we have as, a, as we look at the planet is understanding that some of it, uh, some of the water is actually frozen. And the topic of our conversation today is gonna be ice. And I'd invite you to think about why, <clears throat> why is it that the poles are cold? And you know that the North Pole is cold, you know the South Pole is cold, but why is that? And I'm sort of asking you to think about it on a planetary scale. So the Earth is a sphere, it's in space, the heat is coming to the Earth from the sun. And so why are the poles so cold? And as you think about it, I'm gonna demonstrate, I'm gonna use a globe. So if we can get spotlighted to me, uh, this is a globe. It's a magnificent National Geographic globe. I keep it on my desk, I love it. And uh, of course I'm a geologist, so I love wandering globe. And uh, if we think about the sun, I, I'm gonna get my phone to be a flash, which you guys can all do. But so here I've got a sun standing on the earth and the sun shines towards the equator. 
right? So the sun is shining on the equator and what's happening up at the high latitudes, meaning up at the very top of the sphere, I think you can appreciate, and you guys can do this experiment yourselves. You can use a globe and a flashlight and you'll see as you shine the rays of the sun at the equator, it comes straight down on the equator. So the equator is relatively warm, but the Northern latitude and the Southern latitudes, the sun's rays are coming in at a very low angle. They're coming in obliquely to the sphere. And consequently, if you live up at the North Pole or if you live down at the South Pole, the sun is very low on the horizon. It doesn't shine very brightly. And because you get very low energy from the sun, those areas are, are unusually cold. So that's the quick explanation for why there's such a difference in terms of temperature from the equatorial areas to the polar areas on the earth. And that's it's important for our discussion about the distribution of ice. And we mentioned that the Earth is a water planet and that the uh, ice uh, is, is a part of our water system. And we have a demonstration just to show, just to illustrate that point. If we pictured all the water on the surface of the Earth in a gallon jug, if we put, put all the water on the surface of the Earth into a gallon jug, the amount of fresh water would fit in these three Dixie cups. The ma vast majority of the water is salt water in the oceans. The three Dixie cups, two of them are frozen. So of the fresh water on the surface of the earth, two thirds of it is frozen as ice. And then the one third that is liquid, liquid fresh water on the surface of the earth, the majority of it's actually in groundwater and is not very accessible. The amount of water we can actually access easily would be at this scale, the proportional size of an M&M. &M. So in our discussion about water on the surface of the earth, we, we deal with the M&M, &M, that's our liquid fresh water. But for this program, we're gonna talk about the two thirds uh, that are uh, frozen as ice. And now we're gonna take a view. We're gonna use the open space program and ASA is flying us. And we're gonna look at some of the icy places uh, on Earth, just to get a feeling for what kinds of processes go on there. And we're going to be focusing our presentation on the interaction of ice and the ground and the Earth, and sort of what kinds of things happen as ice moves or forms on Earth. And then we'll also talk later on about how ice serves as a record to preserve uh, the history of the past. So let's look at some ice views, uh, starting up maybe in, in Greenland. We might start over in Greenland, which is this big island, you can see it's covered by ice. There's about a thousand meters of ice on Greenland. And uh, Greenland has <clears throat> a very large central ice cap, as you can see. And then it has a series of little tongues of ice that come off down towards the water. And we'll see if Asa can pull us in to look at uh, some of these uh, tongues of ice that come down towards the ocean off of Greenland. And this is an interesting area. We're in the North Atlantic Ocean here, and uh, we're watching these uh, glaciers, uh, which is the name for the moving rivers of ice. They move relatively slowly, but they do move, as we will show you uh, in several places in this program. And they come down in towards the ocean. And you can see here a couple of these valleys are filled with white material. That's ice. As we get down closer, you'll appreciate that the ice is filling the valleys and actually flowing into the ocean. And Asa, if you could show us the left lower left, there's some icebergs that are coming off, that are breaking off these glaciers are producing icebergs. They were just to the lower left of your scene here. And uh, those icebergs are flowing out into the North Atlantic Ocean. And many of you will have heard about uh, shipwrecks associated with ships hitting icebergs, the most famous of which is the Titanic. And uh, the Titanic was a fantastic, beautiful uh, ocean liner sailing on its maiden voyage from England towards North America. And in the middle of the night, it hit an iceberg and it was a great tragedy. The boat sank and there was all kinds of uh, loss of life and struggles because of the ice that was in the North Atlantic Ocean. And that came from one of these glaciers that you can see here feeding off of uh, Greenland. And you can see that there's a there's not much green in Greenland, uh, but, but it certainly has a lot of ice and snow, and the ice and snow gets into these valleys and flows down towards the sea. After we've admired Greenland a little bit more, we might back out 
and uh, visit another icy area that's relatively near Greenland. And we are going to go to the island of Iceland. So let's, um, during this last couple of glaciers here on Greenland, we're going to back up. And you can see how those glaciers feed into the North Atlantic. And you can imagine the, some of the icebergs there, the lower float right out into the open ocean and of course can be tremendously treacherous. Now we're looking over at Iceland and Iceland is, uh, has more green than Greenland. Uh, we're gonna drop in and see some of the big glaciers uh, on Iceland. Iceland is a fantastic place to visit for geologists. It's got wonderful active volcanoes. In fact, there's a little volcano that just sprouted uh, about half a year ago near Reykjavik, which is the capital of uh, Iceland. And uh, the students from, I, from Reykjavik, they, they came out from high school and grade schools to see the volcano and they roasted hot dogs over the hot lava. And I'm quite, not quite sure how they did that because there's no sticks in Iceland. There, there's a shortage of sticks. So somehow they roasted hot dogs uh, over the volcano using maybe using metal sticks. But we're coming into uh, Vatnajökull, one of the big glaciers uh, in Iceland. And you can see, like we saw in Greenland, the tongues of ice coming off of the uplands flowing down towards the sea. And Ace is going to give us a close-up view here uh, of one of the lakes into which the uh, glaciers are flowing. And there's a fun story here because the lake has a little gap where it flows into the ocean. Again, we're on the edge of Iceland here, the southeast edge of Iceland. And that little gap has the shortest river in Europe. That's a little tiny stream, less than a kilometer long, that flows from the, from the lake into the ocean. You can see there's a little gap there, right where there's some white icebergs. And that's a little river right there where Ace is pointing, and that's flowing into the, uh, uh, into the North Atlantic. And you can see the glaciers are flowing into the lake, just the way they were uh, on the Bering Glacier that uh, was shown by Mitch on his background a few minutes ago. These are glaciers flowing into that lake, and you can see all kinds of interesting folded kinds of patterns. The ice is behaving almost like a plastic. It's, it's literally flowing and it's got bends and breaks and uh, these wonderful, beautiful stripes. Some of those stripes are volcanic ash from uh, volcanic eruptions in Iceland that have landed on the ice. So you've got a combination of ice and volcanic ash uh, and very interesting things. You can also see the texture of the surface of the ice is very rough. It's got all kinds of uh, crevasses and a uh, super dangerous place to, uh, to try to walk around on. And one of the things that's characteristic of, uh, of high mountain areas is they are relatively cold. As you get into high altitudes, the air has less humidity in it. It dries out and, uh, and warmth uh, is not preserved. And so you have cold in high mountains as well as at high latitudes. And we're going to step away from Iceland. We're going to see if we can head over to some of the highest mountains in the world, which are in Asia. And we'll see if there's any ice over there. So what is the highest mountain in the world? I think you guys know the answer to that. What mountain range is it in? It's in a mountain range that begins with an H and the mountain itself begins with an E. And we're going to be, yes, I see people are, no, oh, it's coming into the chat. Everybody's clamoring for it. We're going to be going to the Himalaya mountains and we're going to be looking for Mount Everest and we're going to see if there's any ice on Mount Everest. So we're going to spin the globe here using open space and ACE is going to fly us around. We're passing North Africa. We're passing Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. We're going to be crossing over towards India. And there you can see India coming into view and the chain of mountains at the north side of India is called the Himalayas, and they go from Pakistan on the left-hand side over to Bhutan uh, on the eastern side or the right-hand side, and we're going to zoom right down in towards the area where the highest mountains in the world are, and it's a, right on the front of the Himalaya mountains with the Tibetan plateau behind and Nepal and India on the, on the bottom of your screen, and we're zooming in towards a super high peak here, and uh, we're going to be looking at ice conditions in these very high mountains. So let's see if we can see any ice. You can start to see glaciers. You're seeing flowing glaciers. The valleys are filled with white material. That's the ice that's flowing. 
and it's coming from the snow-covered mountain tops. Uh, the Himalaya mountains capture the snow as the moist air moves off the Indian Ocean. It snows heavily in the Himalaya mountains, and that snow uh, accumulates and forms ice in the valleys. That's how glaciers form, and we're going to see if we can get right down close and see these uh, glaciers close up. So we're going to come in, we're flying in using uh, Uniview. This is something you guys can do using Google Earth at home. You can take views very similar to this at home and investigate what the world looks like. But we're gonna see if we can actually get down on the ground here. So Ace has got to shift gears on his transmission and see if we can actually put ourselves on the ground, which is a pretty neat trick, but we'll see if we can get it to work. So we're coming down in, let's see if we can get that Hey, so I'm not sure it's not easy to land this thing. So we got to do this a little bit carefully. And I see up, oh, I see we're coming down through the clouds. There we are, we're landing. Oh my gosh. So there we, we're gazing right across at some of these highest peaks. And uh, we're going to, if we keep, we'll shift around a little bit. You'll see there's ice on the tops of these mountains. Keep shifting it around. And you'll see that the ice is uh, forming into the valleys. It, it falls off the steep cliffs into the valleys. It's blown in there by wind. And actually the uh, snow is compacted and turns into the ice that flows as glaciers. There you can see some of the glaciers flowing off. The highest peak in the area is Mount Everest, as you guys guessed. And that has the snow plume blowing off of it right there in the background. And then flowing off of the Everest area are a whole series series of glaciers, not just one or two, there's three or four or five, and these glaciers are flowing down the valleys, and they're extremely rugged, and if you're going to climb Mount Everest, depending a little bit on which side you come up, you've got to climb up through these ice falls on these glaciers. It's extremely dangerous. Some of the most dangerous rock climbing and mountain climbing in the world is up in the Himalayas when you climb up along the unstable uh, glaciers. Some of the glaciers are covered in rock, and some of the glaciers are just beautiful ice, and uh, the glaciers are melting here in the Himalayas, like they're melting all around the world uh, as the world gets warmer. So we're seeing the effects of global warming on the melting of these glaciers. But you can see how, how rugged the landscape is up here uh, and uh, how challenging it would be to climb in these mountains. But some of you may do this someday. And uh, if you go to Nepal, you can visit these mountains and you can see the glaciers and uh, you can go on, on traps, tracks up here you might have a yak carrying some of your stuff and uh, you'll see these beautiful ponds and then you'll see the amazing ice and glaciers that are so characteristic of these high mountains. And we're gonna try to see some more glaciers. Uh, we, we're gonna go to uh, some glaciers that are in Alaska and we've got a poll for you guys to, get, to choose which glacier you wanna go see. And we've got one glacier that looks like a taffy puddle and we've got another glacier that looks like a caterpillar and we're going to offer you guys the choice so uh in your uh at your schools you can vote for either taffy puddle or caterpillar uh as a poll and we'll see it come up uh, in a few minutes and we will go to the one that wins the most votes so i think uh if kim if we've got the the uh the voting open they can vote for either one or the other and i'm I hope you've got had a chance to see a place where you can vote for one or the other. We had a poll mishap. So if you could just uh, type your answer in the chat. Okay, yep, the poll's not working quite right. So yeah, type an answer into the chat. Okay, we see the votes are coming in fast and furious. I hope Mitch, you can sort of keep track. Uh, I see a lot of votes for Caterpillar, uh, a few for Taffy, oh, there's more for Caterpillar. Taffy pudding's getting, I don't know, it's getting pretty close. Mitch, what do you think? Uh, it'll take a little while to tabulate all the votes, but it looks to me like Caterpillar has an edge. I think Caterpillar has the edge. So let's uh, go to Caterpillar. And then so many people also voted for Taffy that we'll, we'll first go to Caterpillar and then we'll go to Taffy. Let's do it that way. So, so let's go to uh, the Caterpillar Glacier, which of course doesn't, that's not really its name. It's got a fancier name called, it's called the Grand Plateau Glacier. It's in Southeastern Alaska. And some of you guys are from Alaska, so you might know more about it than we do, but we're gonna go to the Grand Plateau Glacier and uh, we think it looks a little bit like a caterpillar and we'll let you guys decide what you think it looks like. But uh, it's a little bit tricky to find it. Ace has got to navigate in here to find the right glacier. 
And uh, we're going <laughs> to, there's a lot of glaciers to choose from, but we're going to get one that we think looks like a caterpillar and we'll see if you guys agree. So these glaciers are flowing again from the mountaintops down towards the ocean. Uh, and you can see each glacier sort of combines with other glaciers, they merge together. And sometimes when two glaciers merge together, there's a black stripe in the middle and th that's called a medial moraine. And there's the moraine is the rocky material on the edge of the glacier. And when two glaciers come together, there's a middle moraine. And the fancy way of saying that is medial. So that's, you're seeing a medial moraine. Then you're also seeing some, some landslides, those black stripes, uh, the little black U-shaped things are landslides that have fallen down onto the glacier uh, as it was passing by places where there was rocky falls coming into the uh, glacial valley. And you'll see the landslide material with the glacier. And we've got a video sure, moving through time so you're gonna be able to see what these things look like uh, as the glacier is actually flowing. So let's see if we can, here's the 20 year uh, or time lapse. And it's done with, uh, they take satellite pictures and when the video, when the air is clear and they can see the, the glacier, they take the picture and put it together. You can see how the glaciers are actually flowing. You can see the, black little bands flowing down the glacier as it's being carried by the moving ice. When you stand on a glacier, and I've stood on many glaciers, it feels very solid. You can't get a feeling that anything's moving at all. But if you look at it through time, taking pictures over the years, you can see there's dramatic movement. And we sort of thought this looked a little, a little bit like caterpillars moving. So we can, they say maybe you'll take us down again a little bit and we'll see a little bit more of what this landscape looks like and see if you guys agree with us that it looks a little bit like a caterpillar. And then when it started to move, we could say, well, that looked like a caterpillar crawling along. And it's got these little bumps in it. You can see little ridges and the little ridges are, uh, they come every year you get a ridge. And we might look back up the valley a little bit, uh, Asa, to get a feeling of, the, of what the thing looks like up the valley. And each of those little ridges there that look like little U-shaped things represent one year of flow. And it's because the glacier is going over a cliff somewhere up the valley. And in the warm season, it flows quickly. In the dry and cold season, it flows slowly. And you get those ridges on the surface of the glacier. And they, they're called ogives. There's a fancy word for them that geologists use called ogives. So this is the territory around uh, what we thought of as a caterpillar glacier. And uh, we'll get maybe one last view of it up that valley. It's really beautiful. Uh, Asa. And then there were a lot of people that also wanted to see the Taffy Puddle Glacier. So let's go see the Taffy Puddle Glacier. And uh, <laughs> that's got, a, it's, its real name is the uh, Malaspina Glacier. It's also in Southeastern Alaska, uh, pretty close by and uh, easier to find because it's a very big place. So you can see it sort of in the middle of the screen there. And uh, it's flowing down from the St. Elias Mountains and the high mountains up in the Alaska range. And it's flowing down onto a big area, very near sea level, a lot like what we saw over in Iceland. And here you can see this beautiful uh, complicated pattern uh, in the ice. And it's a combination, the, the white would be the ice and the darker materials would be uh, mor moraines, rocky material, from the uh, edge of the glacier. And you can see it sort of creates this very strange pattern that we thought looked a little bit like taffy, you know, sort of like, like a puddle of taffy. And I think we've got a video of this glacier we can pull up and you'll see it move through time. It's an amazing thing. Again, this is 20 or so years, or actually 30 or 40 years of uh, time lapse, multiple satellite images put together, but giving you a feeling about how how the ice is moving on the surface of the earth. And it, again, if you stood on it, you wouldn't know it was happening. It's, but when you look at it through time, you can see these changes. And, and people have done this in lots of different places around the world, including of course in Alaska. And if you take pictures that your parents took, and then you go and back and look at the same glacier, uh, you can definitely see changes. In many cases, the glaciers of course are shrinking because of global warming. So as the world gets warmer, uh, the ice is melting and the glaciers around the whole world are getting smaller and smaller. So a wonderful view there 
of the, uh, of the Taffy Glacier uh, that we think is one of the prettiest things to see. And then, you know, we, we, we think about the whole world and, and whether there's been ice in other places around the world, in some places maybe where there's history of ice, it's no longer there. And we're gonna now fly ourselves over to Colorado. And a lot of you uh, who are coming with us today are from Colorado. We're gonna see what the evidence is of ice in Colorado. And to do that, we're gonna have to fly, we're gonna have to pull back up to satellite level. So we're leaving Alaska. You can see the Southeastern Alaska, a little bit of Canada there. And we're gonna leave the Gulf of Alaska. We're gonna cross over to the, it looks like we're spinning around a little bit in space, but we're gonna find ourselves back on North America and we will get ourselves to Colorado. And once we get to Colorado, the uh, challenge will be to see if there's evidence of ice that's not there anymore. So we're going to be looking for evidence of ice in Colorado and evidence of glaciers in Colorado. And we will see if we can find that, that, that there have been glaciers that are no longer with us. So we're going to zoom back in. We've got North America there. You're looking at it from a high satellite view. And we're going to be coming in. Uh, we've got the western part of the United States. Uh, Colorado, we're zooming in towards central Colorado. We're gonna be in the Rocky Mountains, west of Denver, and we're heading for Vista uh, near Leadville, places that you guys might've been to. And we're gonna be looking at some of the valleys in the Collegiate are coming down from the, uh, and other mountains along the Collegiate and the Sawatch Range. And these valleys, uh, which have the Twin Lakes in them here, we're near Buena Vista, and the Twin Lakes are filling an old glacial valley. And if you look up that valley, you can see that it's got a U-shaped floor. The bottom of the valley is shaped like a U, and then the lakes are held up in these moraines. So the, it's called, again, lateral moraines and terminal moraines, and the moraines are holding these twin lakes. And there's actually a little moraine that separates the two lakes, that little ridge that just went out of the field of view. And then if you look up the valley, you can see that the valley floor is pretty rounded. And we call it a U-shaped valley, and it is carved by ice. And if you go into these valleys, if you walk up in here, and you guys can do this, you can go on a trip up into these mountains. If you look at the rocks in the valleys, you can see that they're polished and scratched by ice. So these valleys were formed by ice, and ice has the ability to carve the earth it has the ability to break rocks. It has the ability to polish rocks. And ice can be a tremendously powerful force. And one of the things that, that happens when water freezes is it expands. It gets a little bit larger by volume. And if you freeze and thaw wet ground, you freeze it and thaw it, freeze it and thaw it. Every time it freezes, there's a little bit of expansion. Every time it thaws, it shrinks. And eventually, it breaks the rocks up. And so the mountains are sculpted by the ice. And uh, we were thinking about that and saying, well, we weren't sure how strong uh, this freezing and thawing would be if it would really break the rocks or not. And uh, Mitch is gonna get, do an experiment for us. And we're gonna see if we can get a video of an experiment that's gonna show the effects of freezing on uh, the, the effects of expansion associated with freezing. Let's see if we can get Mitch's video to show up. Just how powerful is the expansion of ice as it freezes? Do you think it's powerful enough to break apart this galvanized iron pipe? Well, let's find out. Now, obviously, it's not cold enough here where I am to freeze this pipe, but I have something that is very, 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 very cold, and that is liquid nitrogen. So this container is full of liquid nitrogen, which at this altitude is about negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit. What you can see as I pour it, it's boiling like crazy because this room temperature container is about 400 degrees hotter and you have this cool cloud forming as all the water vapor in the air uh, condenses. Now we're gonna take this metal pipe and we're gonna fill it with water and put in a plug so the water can't possibly get out. And I wanna be careful, I'm gonna screw the plug in in the water because I don't wanna get any air in there because air can actually compress and so it will undermine our awesome experiment. Now, there's no telling what will happen here. It could expand and uh, cause a little crack. It could expand and blow apart a whole side of this elbow. It all depends on this particular elbow and what its 
uh, weak points are, even though it's all yeah, galvanized iron, somewhere in there is going to be slightly less uh, strong than the rest of the pipe. Okay, so I have my safety trash can here. I'm going to put the liquid nitrogen in there. And then we're going to put the pipe elbow full of water in liquid nitrogen. And then everybody hide! Oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds like something happened in there. Let's uh, see what happened to our metal pipe. Oh. oh, there we go. Got a crack right in the metal pipe. You can see the uh, the side there has bulged out. It's actually cracked through this metal pipe, which is looks like about half an inch thick to me. That's amazing. This is a galvanized iron pipe, and ice, just water freezing, was able to break it. And this is something people have been doing this kind of experiment for years. Back in the 1700s, some scientists filled a uh, cannon with water to see what would happen. And also our container uh, felt some of the damage of that explosion as well. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing. Freezing ice, powerful enough to break apart iron. So just how... Well, well thank you, Mitch. That was a pretty impressive display of the power of, the of uh, water as it converts to ice. And has has many other characteristics. One of the things I mentioned briefly before is that the ice can serve as a record of time. And uh, there are many places on the surface of the earth where we can look at ice records by coring into glaciers, whether on a mountaintop or in Antarctica or in Greenland. And the cores that we get from ice have a history of the climate preserved in them. Let's see if we can see a video of coring ice. And this is something that's done uh, in Greenland. There have been five or six big core holes in Greenland. We'll see, this is Greenland, and here's an ice coring operation going on in Greenland. They're lowering in the coring device down there. Here's the ice being sucked out of the core, and they're starting to look at it. They're, and you can see, look at that, you can start to see some layers in the ice. So we're gonna see this in a little bit more detail. They're working in this big underground laboratory there, and they're examining these ice cores, and then they store them in these carefully organized tubes, and they eventually go into a refrigerated storage compartment here. And we have one of these in Littleton at the Federal Center, and you guys can visit this, those of you who live in Denver. It's an ice core library, and the ice core library has thousands of meters of ice core, and the ice core is looked at by scientists who look at the ice core to study what the layers look like. And the layers in the ice core, here's, a, you can see putting the ice on a light table, you can look through it. And if you look closely at the ice, you'll actually see it has layers. And the ice storage laboratory is at minus 40 degrees centigrade, which is the same as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And I've had students in here looking at these ice layers and the students will often say, well, we're just gonna walk into that lab and look at the layers. And I say, well, don't you wanna take an extra jacket? And the students say, oh, no, we're, we're tough. We're tough students. And they go in, and it is super cold in there. And the students all huddle together, sort of like penguins. And the students that are in the middle of the huddle are trying to stay in the middle. The students that are on the outside edges of the huddle want to get into the middle. And so that it makes a very dramatic move. And the students don't forget going to visit the ice core lab. And what you can see when you look closely at the ice cores we see that picture of the ice layers. We might look at that again, which is from Greenland. And this is a sample of an ice core from Greenland. And every one of those layers represents a year. The cleaner, uh, clear ice is the, is the winter ice that comes down when the snow accumulates in the winter. And then the, the whitish layers are where it melts a little bit in summertime. And so you get a little bit of melting in the summer and then the freezing in the winter. And you 
creates a series of layers and you can count the layers. There's one per year. It's a lot like tree rings. And the record uh, that's preserved in the ice is really interesting. You can see some little white dots. Those are actually bubbles of air and the ice has fossilized air in it. And you can take the ice and melt it and you can get the air out of the ice. And by doing that, they look at the composition of the earth's atmosphere back through time. So the ice cores preserve this wonderful record of the composition of the Earth's atmosphere through time. And in looking at these data from these bubbles, we can see the change in the content of carbon dioxide in the air, which is of course a greenhouse gas. And that helps us better understand how climate has changed in the past and is changing today. And as we get more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere because of the burning of fossil fuels, we have created an enhanced greenhouse effect, which is leading to the Earth's surface getting warmer. So global warming is happening and the ice on the surface of the Earth is melting. And ice from Antarctica, for example, which, which Asa is showing us here, that ice is flowing into the Southern oceans. And as the ice melts, sea level is rising. And sea level is rising relatively slowly, but it's rising at about about three millimeters per year right now. Here's half showing sea level rise. And the sea level rise data in the beginning, back in the 1880s on the left-hand side was taken from things like tide gauges. It was a little bit uh, uh, not very precise, but in more recent times, the darker line on the right-hand side of the graph is data that's coming from satellites where they're measuring very carefully the elevation of the sea surface and that three millimeter per year rise is something that is a global phenomenon. And of course it's affecting coastal communities. And you might say, well, three millimeters, how much is that? That's about like two pennies stacked on top of each other every year. And you might say, well, that's not very much, but I'm a geologist. And uh, for me, that's a, that's a huge amount because every year, three millimeters, and then it's the number is actually increasing. So it's a little bit more than three millimeters. And we have thousands of people, millions of people living right at sea level. If you think about people living in, living in New York City, people living in uh, San Francisco, and then around the world, like in Shanghai, in China, uh, in Lagos, in Nigeria, there's lots and lots of people living right at sea level. And as sea level rises, and you have floods associated with storms, uh, you might have you know, winter storms with high waves, you might have hurricanes in some places, and as sea level rises, there's more and more danger associated with living at sea level. And you're gonna be hearing about that. That's gonna be one of the challenges that your generation's gonna face because we've got so many people living at, you know, in danger, and we need to figure out how to be resilient. We need to figure out how to do engineering to protect our coastal communities from, from sea level rise. So as we draw our, our program to an end, uh, we're going to mention that we've got a, an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you've got questions, you can type them into the chat. And we're going to end in a couple minutes here, but then we're willing to stay for 10, 15 minutes of questions and answers. So the, as we look at the globe here, we're looking at uh, showing us the whole world. You can see the beautiful oceans. You can see the green of South America, the green of the eastern part of the North America. And then think about this globe and how it's changing through time. And one of the things that the ice core records show us and our observations of glacier, glaciers show us is that all the way around the world, uh, ice is melting and that ice melts and enters the sea. And as the ice melts and enters the sea, the sea levels are rising. So there's a connection there between the ice and the oceans. And that's something that does affect all of us. Everyone on the surface of the earth is affected by this. And these global changes are things that we're studying. Uh, geologists are studying it. Geophysicists are studying it. Uh, there are many different disciplines of people who are studying the effects of change through time. And there's wonderful opportunities for careers and for science careers, uh, for people to look and study these phenomenon and look at how they're affecting people and how they're affecting animals and how they're affecting the ecosystems of the surface of the earth. So we'd like to finish up with, a, again, an invitation to come and join us uh, at the Denver Museum. We're open. 
come to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science City Park in downtown Denver, and we'd love to have you visit us. And we hope that you'll come to again to another Digital Earth Academy program uh, in the future. And with that, we, what we might do is, uh, Mitch, I might suggest that if you could look through the chat a little bit and see if there's some questions, we could uh, have a little bit further discussion, but uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining us today. Absolutely. And our next uh, Digital Earth Academy will be February 8th. And the topic is from Stonehenge to skyscrapers. So we'll be looking at uh, human-made structures and the way that humans have reshaped the earth. <clears throat> uh, so we do have quite a few questions. Um, let's start with this one. Could ice take over the world? Well, you know, the question is about could ice take over the world is one that geologists have, have worried about a lot. And, and uh, at this moment, uh, things are melting. So as the world is getting warmer, the ice is retreating. But if we look back through geologic time, it is very clear that there were times when it was much colder and ice did extend across very many areas that are today uh, <laughs> very tropical. Even places like, like New York City, if you go to New York City, if you go to Central Park, when you go to Central Park, look at the rocks in Central Park. And of course, the geology is awesome. The rocks are beautiful, but they're polished by ice. If you go to New York City, you will see rocks polished by ice exposed in Central Park. So ice at one time did take over New York City. And that was back in the Pleistocene. Uh, as recently, actually, geologically recently as 12 to 15,000 years ago, there was that much more ice. So yes, ice can take over the world. All right, and a related question. What animals besides penguins and polar bears live in the frozen places and what do they eat? Well, that's a, an interesting question. Uh, you know, you can look at it in two different ways. You can say, well, like in high mountains, what animals live up in high mountains where there's a lot of ice. And if you think about Colorado, if you go up into the high mountains, there's lots of critters that live up there. Things like pikas and marmots, they live up in the high mountains of Colorado up where there's a lot of ice and uh, birds, of course, lots of birds live up in there. And uh, the pikas, uh, they, they eat grass. And uh, in the late fall, the pikas, which are little animals about the size of a softball, they organize their grass piles. And if you walk up in Colorado high mountains in the fall, you'll see using their cut the grass, dry it with their dry and they pull it down to their houses or their burrows and they stockpile it because that's what they eat in the winter time. So they, they eat grass. All right, fun. Um, <clears throat> so what is the biggest iceberg? Oh, the biggest iceberg, you know, that, that's, a, that's of course a, a question that probably changes from time to time, you know, in, in terms of, uh, because the icebergs come and, and go. And uh, Ace is showing a Central Park there on the left. So those of you who have not yet been to New York City, that's uh, Central Park is a beautiful place right in New York. But the biggest icebergs are breaking off of the ice shelves uh, of Antarctica. If you go down to the South Pole, and uh, we might actually do that, Ace, if you'd like, we go down to the South Pole, and you'll see the big ice shelves. And uh, actually, in one of the images you showed a few minutes ago, Ace, we could see some of the places where they're breaking. The ice shelves of Antarctica are layers of ice on the ocean that are connected to the continent of Antarctica, but every once in a while, big cracks form, particularly as the ocean down there is warming, and the ice shelves are starting to break up around Antarctica, and they produce massive icebergs the size of Rhode Island. I mean, they're the, and it again, every year is a little bit different as to which one has broken off and how big it is because they, they relatively quickly break apart. But you'll see uh, Ace is flying us down towards some of the ice shelves. And uh, I think if you just scoot right in there, you'll see something on the edge on the right-hand side. But in any case, what's happening is the, the ice around the continent of Antarctica flows out onto the sea and forms very big shelves. And then those shelves spawn or break apart and create the largest 
icebergs on Earth. Yeah, that's straight in there, maybe at the top of the screen on the left. I'm, I'm sort of guessing a little bit, but that could be a place where an ice shelf is breaking off. See, you can see a, it looks like a big piece of glacier is sort of breaking apart. I think that's, that's exactly what that is. So that's about to create one of the largest icebergs on earth right there. And we can zoom in closer, Asa, you'll see the, the configuration nicely. So you can see how it's pulling away. And so the biggest iceberg is actually that, that part of the very top of the screen and if you, were, if you were camped out in a tent on that iceberg, you wouldn't even know that you were on an iceberg. You'd think that it was part of the mainland and the whole thing is breaking loose. Wow. <clears throat> and we have another question. Do any animals live on icebergs? Oh, of course. yes, absolutely. Uh, seals love to live on icebergs and penguins live on icebergs. So the answer is yes. And the seals of course live I mean, they they are live in the water too, but they come up onto the ice, and uh, the penguins, of course, live on the ice, and uh, they fish in the water. So there's quite a few animals that will will come up on the ice and use it uh, as a place to rest. Polar bears will do that. Walruses will do that. So uh, they're getting their food from the ocean, but they'll they'll rest on the ice. Now, a uh, <clears throat> slightly dire question. How much of the world would flood if the sea level keeps rising? Well, the question will be, how much does the sea level rise? And the answer to that is, uh, is difficult to, to be very quantitative. In other words, uh, the world is, the edges of the sea are rising, so the sea level is rising and flooding the land. The question is how much is sea level going to rise? And the scientists are working on that right now. There's actually a lot of concern about the rate of sea level rise, right? I said it was three millimeters per year and that's increasing a little bit, but there's also some potential for some big ice sheets to melt in Antarctica, which would create more rapid sea level rise. But in any case, we know that over your lifetimes, meaning over the next 60 to 80 years, there will be significant sea level rise, meaning you know, a foot or more around the world. And our cities like Miami, uh, like uh, uh, New York City, like Washington DC, like San Francisco and Los Angeles, are cities that are sitting right on the edges of the ocean will need to take uh, engineering steps to protect themselves from sea level rise. Those are gonna be expensive, you know, and there'll be a lot of need for engineers, a lot of need for scientists to figure out how to do uh, engineering along coastal conditions, not just in the United States, but of course, around the whole world. All right, now back to ice. What is the strongest thing that ice could break? Well, you know, the, the, mo the movie that you showed, Mitch, showed ice breaking steel. And um, I think if you took a, a container of almost any material and you sealed it the way Mitch sealed, remember how he tightened that pipe? He super tightened that pipe. So if that pipe had been made out of something, even I will speculate, I'm speculating a little bit, but if that pipe had been made out of diamond, which we think of as super tough, but if you had... A, a diamond container that you could somehow make and seal it completely tight and put water in it and then froze that water, I suspect it would crack even a diamond. I think that's right. And I mentioned at the end that uh, scientists filled up a cannon, a big metal cannon with ice and it did crack open the cannon back in the 1700s. So, and like you said, breaks apart mountains. So maybe there's nothing ice can't break. Uh, so we talked about the South Pole with the seals and the penguins. Are there any animals that live at the North Pole? Oh, yeah. I mean, the North Pole is a place where, uh, unlike Antarctica, there's no land. So the, the North Pole is, uh, is, has the Arctic Ocean. So the, 
the animals that live at the very North Pole would be critters that lived in the sea and the ocean, and they might come up from time to time to the surface, and there'd be seals uh, that might do that up near the North Pole. Uh, but if you get down towards uh, a little bit south of the North Pole, uh, the polar bears live there, and they live on land, but they also extend their, they swim easily in the ocean, and they're perfectly happy walking around on icebergs. So the polar bears are pretty common up in the high northern latitudes. And then there's a lot of other critters. There's caribou, and there's wolves, and uh, of course, there's all kinds of vegetation that live up in the tundra, up in the high Arctic. So there's a lot of life, up, even in very far northern latitudes. Yes. Very cool. Okay. Where is the thickest ice, or do we know where that would be? The th yeah, the, the thick, we do. The thickest ice is in Antarctica. And we study that by using radar. And radar, just the same kind of radar that they use to, to find airplanes, if you take a radar and you shine it down, it'll reflect off the bottom of the ice. And so we have mapped the thickness of ice in Antarctica and the thickest ice in the world is in Antarctica. There's also very thick ice in Greenland, but the ice in Antarctica is a little bit thicker. Um, and it's more than, a, it's, it's almost a mile thick in Antarctica. It's more than a kilometer thick in, in, uh, in Greenland. So it's very, very thick. All right, and just really quick, people wanted to be reminded where where is the Caterpillar Glacier located again? So the yeah the Caterpillar Glacier is in southeastern Alaska, and if you fly on Google Earth to southeastern Alaska, the name of it is the Grand Plateau Glacier, and Google might be able to find that. But if you explore using Google Earth in southeastern Alaska, you will find it the caterpillar is sitting there waiting for you. All right. And I think we're reaching just about the end of our program. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Bob, for leading us all around. Um, any final thoughts before we go? Well, I, I want to, again, express our gratitude to the whole team uh, at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and then the extended team, which would include NASA, and our friend Tito Dupre, who did the uh, pano at uh, near Mount Everest. And, and, and it takes a team effort to put a program like this together and lots of different people contributing their work in different ways. And we're extremely grateful to all of them pulling together. And then it's all done under the, you know, under the guidance of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So we really invite you to come to the museum, uh, to participate in our programs, and to uh, visit with us someday. We look forward to meeting you someday in Denver at the museum. All right, well said. And thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon.